back a year ago. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of the Beer Bound Podcast. Today, we're joined by Professor Noel Phillips. Noel teaches in the English department at Douglas College in New Westminster, British Columbia. Her research focus is in late medieval book culture and Middle English literature, particularly William Langland's poem, Pierce Plowman, Chaucer, and the 15th century political adaptations of John Lydgate's poetry. However, she is also very interested in medievalisms, how later readers, including modern ones, understand, reimagine, and use the medieval period. In 2019, Noel published the text entitled Craft Beer Culture and Modern Medievalism. The book gives analysis of literary and historical texts, advertisements, labels, and interviews with craft brewers and writers to argue that craft beer is much more than a delicious drink and a social connector. Its marketing, its appeal, and its ubiquitous presence in middle-class North America reveals a powerful cultural desire for the past in a world that privileges the present. Noel also published a book this year entitled Beer and Brewing in, Medi in Medieval Culture and Contemporary Medievalism. She is also in the process of Another text that relates to the history of craft brewing in Vancouver from 1880 to 1920 and 1980 to present day. Wow, we're very excited to speak to Noel and learn more about beer and its profound global complexity. So Noel, welcome to the Beer Bound podcast. How are you doing? Uh, great. Thanks for chatting with me. Lots of fun. Welcome. Welcome indeed. Noel, again, we like to say that we barely scratched the surface with these little introductions. So can you maybe delve a little bit deeper in your academic focus, your interests and particular desire in the English language and your academic focus and maybe a little bit of beer to boot. The floor is yours. Yeah, so I got into writing about beer through my field, which is uh, the study of medieval literature, specifically Middle English literature. It's it's a, a, a unique literary field because it actually requires you to know uh, a lot about the historical context, maybe even more so than some modern forms, modern uh, studies of literature. And it also requires you to understand the physical context in which the book exists, because no two books are exactly the same in the Middle Ages, which is kind of why I, I love it. Several of the texts that you mentioned, um, Pierce Plowman, John Lydgate's, uh, John Lydgate's poetry, they often talk about beer. Beer is a big element of the culture in the Middle Ages. Uh, in fact, I'm going to be doing a podcast at a conference in the spring that specifically, specifically talks about one of John Lydgate's poems um, about a woman who sells beer. So I've always been kind of interested in this sort of food and drink culture of the Middle Ages, especially in literature. And I uh, I've also been interested in how we in post medieval cultures kind of um, use what we imagine as medieval history to kind of do something for our own culture. So we use it to kind of market something or to make something seem valuable or to disparage something. Um, and so my field of study is part what I'd say medieval history and medieval literature and also part medievalism, which is how do later cultures imagine what the Middle Ages were? And so medievalism is very much about fan fantasy, imagination, kind of making the past do what is useful to you now. So it's very different from the reality of medieval history. Um, and so my first <laughs> paper that kind of got me into the beer medieval thing was actually because I was in London and there was this weird little, um, what they called a pop-up exhibit called Alcoholic Architecture. And these guys were dressed up as medieval monks in front of near Southwark Cathedral. And you would go in there and they were like, you're part of the monk group now or whatever. They said something like this, something very mysterious sounding. You go through this like medieval tunnel and then you got to like wear these little rain jackets and go into a gin cloud and inhale the gin and that's supposed to you stay in the cloud for an hour and it's like having a gin and tonic. I mean, it, 
very strange. Um, but I was sort of fascinated by their use of this monk figure to create this experience. And uh, so it kind of started getting me into this. And, and now I write for um, some BC um, beer publications just for the general public. So not academic, but um, blogs and magazines and such. Noel, can you inform me a little bit just because I'm not so specifically knowledgeable on this? What is the medieval period? Is that the same as the Middle Ages? Can you tell us a little bit about the background of this particular historic time period? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I teach a course that we're supposed to cover all the literature of the Middle Ages, which I'm always like, no. Um, in general, the medieval period is thought to be from about 500 to about 1500. But there's not a kind of hard boundary on either side. In general, um, people think of it as the time in Europe after the Roman Empire withdrew, um, extending until maybe what we think of as sort of secular humanism takes over or what is sort of the Renaissance, um, the Enlightenment. Medievalists have an issue with that. Uh, it's, it's not so much that people became smarter or people kind of knew science better. Um, it's more like information travel differently. So we get the printing press emerging in the 15th century. Um, you get the fall of the Byzantine Empire with the fall of Constantinople. You get a lot of changes in a short period of time. And so we move into what we think of as the early modern period then. Um, and so that, that medieval period, you first see that word be used in Italy, where they start to talk about the middle age of the church. And then this idea of the middle, like this is a, an era of time between two times starts to happen when people realize they want to seem different from the people that were like a hundred years ago. And so you see a people, people in like 1500 talking about people in 1400, like they were cavemen um, back in the dark days. But I'm like, yeah, that's like still your role. Like it's, it's a hundred years. They weren't, you know, these weren't Neanderthals. But there's a desire to be like, no, no, we're really different. Like we're enlightened now, we're in the light, they were in the dark, we're better, they're worse. Um, and so medieval or the middle ages, same thing. Uh, medieval is just the uh, kind of adjective that comes out of, of that desire <laughs> to separate uh, this later culture from the earlier one. If you can tell us just a little bit about I mean, it's a massive, it's like a thousand years, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's huge. It's, it's many, many cultures and yeah. many, many discoveries and a lot of important work on the scientific method. And there's a lot of important stuff that happens in that millennium. Yeah, I couldn't even imagine going over all the literary texts of the 21st century, let alone <laughs> a thousand year time period. But can you touch on the significance? I mean, this, the the geographical realm of, of the medieval period, the Middle Ages. I mean, a lot of it is associated with Western Central Europe, essentially these sort of areas. Can you talk a little bit about the, the sort of dominant cultures of the day, maybe linking it a little bit to, to beer and its association with the, pro the predominant peoples of the, of, uh, the Middle Ages? So there's a whole movement called the global middle ages now, because we realize that medieval, when we, we use that term, it is very Eurocentric uh, and uh, countries, uh, obviously the, the North America is the indigenous people living there, South America, um, uh, uh, at the countries of Africa and Asia, they were not experiencing the same patterns that Europe was. And in fact, we're more advanced in many cases. <laughs> Um, so uh, my field is in the European Middle Ages, but I do want to acknowledge that, of course, uh, that does not uh, it, it sort of address these other periods in the, the global kind of perspective. So in Europe at that time, um, the countries that we now think of as like England, say England, France and Germany, let's just keep it like that for now. Um, because those were quite powerful nations. They did not have the same boundaries and, and national divisions that we see with them now. So for example, part of France for a bunch of the Middle Ages was actually part of England. Um, and like the border between what we think of as France and Germany, again, it's not the same. There's all these sort of smaller regions instead and counties. And so um, you get 
various kinds of centers of influence, power is not centralized in quite the same way. So I don't know if you've heard of, well, I'm sure you have, I'm not going to pronounce it. I only type it, I don't pronounce it. So the 1516 purity law from Bavaria, are you guys good at pronouncing it? Because I'm not. Uh, uh, Ryan, but, thank you, thank you, that one. <laughs> I won't say it, I'll just write it down. Okay. Um, that law, <laughs> I mean, that a lot is famous and, and in many spots in Germany, oh, my cat's just okay. taking a break here, um, is still is still well-respected, but it was actually by no means the only law. It was for one relatively small region, only in Bavaria. And there were in fact, a bunch of other different laws in the areas of France and Germany and England that were doing something similar. But because we don't have that centralized form of government, it's harder to track down all those little switches and how beer was made. Um, and I, I just want to put in a little plug for uh, Judith, Bennett, <laughs> Judith Bennett's book about alewives and brewsters in medieval England. And she does a great job with a lot of the tracing out how women were kind of slowly pushed out of the, the brewing industry throughout the Middle Ages in England. Uh, uh, and if you want some more information about details about the brewing industry across Europe, old colleague of mine at University of British Columbia, his name is Richard Unger, and he wrote a book called Beer and Brewing in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. And that is a fascinating book and has a ton of super interesting information. How do we know, I suppose, you obviously have a specialization in literary text. So we know through, say, the works of Geoffrey Chaucer, we know the the profound association that that beer had with English culture in the when was Chaucer the 13th century uh, 14th you're close 14th, uh, yeah. a little off so how else do we know about these these things is 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 your particular focus and your knowledge in the the culture of different the beer culture I suppose you could say of, of different nations or counties in in um, mainland Europe or in modern day England, is it mostly through these literary texts that, that you know, or are there other historic pieces of documentation or artifacts or things that we can draw from to, to know about beer cultures and how they were different or how they were associated with different peoples of, of Europe in the, in the Middle Ages? So that's a really good question. Um, the Middle Ages is almost, uh, not the Middle Ages, medieval studies is by nature a really interdisciplinary profession. So I am a literary scholar. So my PhD is in English, um, but you have to kind of build up a knowledge and awareness of related fields, depending on what area of literature you're studying. So whether that's archeology, span anthropology, history, uh, art history, uh, these are typical fields that will overlap with in, with that literature when we're talking about the study of the Middle Ages. So um, while I'm a literary scholar and I tend to focus on what literary representations are doing, um, and what, what do they reflect about a culture? Um, obviously, we're aware that a literary representation doesn't necessarily mean it, it's factual. Uh, it can, but it, it doesn't always mean that. Uh, but part of that literary study will include studies of things like household books, in, in which, and this is something I studied in uh, for some major families in England, where you have collections of documentation, how much malt did they buy, where where did the brewing occur, and these are records that are, that are in these books. Um, often those will only be for aristocratic families, almost always, you almost will never find these for um, lower class families. But it's still really interesting to see how the brewing worked. You can also find um, civic records. And again, uh, Judith Bennett's book is excellent for this. Uh, civic records of things like um, the bread and ale sizes. So this is when um, basically every year they make sure that bread and beer were kind of being sold ethically. It's because uh, the same ingredients were used for both. And it was a way to kind of make sure no one was price gouging and that people weren't getting cheated. So you'd have ale tasters testing the beer and you have lists in these government records of who the ale tasters were and who was like brought into the court, you know, Madam so-and-so who like 
didn't make her ale with enough malt and she's getting in trouble in the court and is penalized. She has to pay two shillings or whatever it is. So those kind of government records, the uh, literary texts that talk about beer, the commonplace books or the household books that basically give you grocery lists and, <laughs> and recipes. And there are some kind of archeological materials. Um, I think, I don't know if you know the work of the Norwegian writer Lars Marius Garshol. He wrote a book called Historical Farming Techniques. Histor I think it's just called, no, Historical Brewing Techniques, sorry. And he like, he, it's fascinating. It's not really an academic book, but he goes all through like Scandinavian countries. And it's kind of like an anthropo anthropological study of, of practices that have been retained for centuries. Um, there's also some uh, archaeological material that he discusses as well. That's a bit less with beer. You see some of that with like Egyptian brewing, <laughs> um, other kinds of North African brewing. There's some ar archaeological records. But in terms of the Middle Ages, a lot of it's from Leno stories, like the, the texts that we hear about how the brewing happened and mistakes that were made. And there's a lot of really interesting literature and, and stories told about beer, uh, as well as those those uh, civic and household records. Mm -hmm. Pretty interesting. Like it's almost like you're trying to paint a picture with, or, or put a puzzle together in a sense with with the the number of resources, yes. some different aspects of literatures. How do you even start yeah. there? Like how do you try? I, I know obviously you said you had an interest in, and in, in seems like you know uh, beer culture or maybe beer and food and things like that. So how do you how do you maybe yourself start piecing that together? Do you weigh one uh, uh, literary resource over the other? Is there anything like that? It's a long process. Um, I don't think there's an easy answer to that. I, I find that I, I find one sort of thing that I'm interested in um, and then I kind of pursue it. And I know once you've been doing academic stuff long enough, you you know what sources are going to be legitimate and what aren't, right? Um, you often will also know colleagues who will know specific scholars who are working on such and such. Um, but but like, for example, one thing, there's a, there's a text called the Book of Marjorie Kemp, and it's the first female, it's really the first autobiography written in English, period. Mm. Um, and she was li living in the early 15th century. People sort of diagnose her with various forms of schizophrenia or postpartum psychosis. It's she wrote a wild book. I, I can't even start with the stuff Marjorie Kemp wrote in her book. Um, but she's always talking to God and, and looking for God signs. And uh, she talks about how she wanted to be really famous in the town. And so she started brewing beer. This is one of the, the professions women could, could get into legitimately. They could brew beer. This started to become, they started to kind of be disparaged for it and condemned for it as the 15th, or the 15th century and 16th century proceeded until they weren't allowed to do it anymore. <laughs> Yay. Mm. But Marjorie at the time could. So she's like, I'm going to, I'm going to look great. And this is her sin of vanity. She was going to make beer and everyone's going to think it was amazing. And then she just talks about her frustration that she, she says the barm kept dropping, which is this term that they had for what they, the, I think it was kind of the Krausen, the head of the beer when you brew mm -hmm. it, but it basically meant that the yeast wasn't fermenting properly. And then the beer just never turned out. And she was so embarrassed that like, all her servants pretended they didn't know her and she had to like kind of pretend she hadn't done it. And she was just so embarrassed about the whole thing. And she tried it several times and it didn't work. And I'm like, oh, I hear you. Like I've done home brewing. I know <laughs> I hear you, Marjorie. <laughs> but this sort of the language about what the yeast was and what it did, um, it just made me interested in like, okay, well, who's written about what people knew back then about yeast, you know? Mm -hmm. How did they discover what it was? What, you know, what do people think about women brewing in general? And it leads you down these little scholarly rabbit holes and you find, you know, some anthropologist who's done this and, you know, an art historian who's done that. And yeah, like you said, Garrett, you kind of piece it all together like a puzzle. And it's a long kind of gradual process. I tell my students when they're writing their essays, I'm like, you have to give your head like crock pot time. Like it needs mm -hmm. to kind of, settle in there for a while before this stuff starts to kind of meld together and you start to see relationships between things but yeah the academic process is 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 can be very frustrating mm -hmm. <laughs> sounds yeah but it sounds like if you know as soon as you get you know the 
the reward at the end of all that big long hard work and you know the, the detective work seems like it'd be uh i don't know an ice light at the end of the tunnel anyway it is yeah you're looking for that oh okay i see how it fits together now yeah yeah mm-hmm. cool now well what is the the current literary genres of medievalism or modern medievalism can you get into both a little bit so i called my book my title of my book um modern has modern medievalism in it and that's because i'm really i really am focusing on medievalism now in our sorry my camera's all fuzzy here in our modern era i i would want to emphasize first of all that medievalism doesn't have to be a literary genre it can be anything so disney films you know about cinderella that's medievalism because it, it's giving us a fictionalized version of a medieval past like the disney cinderella or tangled or whatever not tangled frozen or tangled actually for that matter like where <laughs> where do they occur when it's just is like i don't know sleeping beauty like there's no clear sense of what where they are are happening um we're just imagining it's some kind of pre-industrial past and we think it looks medieval and it's just this idea in our heads that this is what the middle ages look like in those disney versions it often doesn't have like uh some of the sewage problems and and cholera and those kinds of things (laughs) but but medievalism um in literature i mean game of thrones is a great example game of thrones is a story very much mapped onto when i say mapped onto him it's kind of like a weird echo of basically the wars of the roses and the hundred years war in like the 14th like to the end of the 15th century and if you look at the different families like (laughs) The Lancasters are like the Lannisters, and then the Starks are like the Percy family in Northumberland, who are near Hadrian's Wall, which is the wall separating England from Scotland. You know, there's all these sort of parallels, but it's still this imaginative or imagined version of that reality. Um, And so anything called medievalism is that imagined version of the Middle Ages when it's not in the Middle Ages. Uh, so people in the 19th century did this all the time you guys know those paintings where there's like a girl with like really long hair and like a knight like picking her up or something you know those Mm pre-raphaelite style paintings it's that's medievalism you know she's like fainting in the grass and he's coming to get her or you know whatever she's brushing her hair and looking in a mirror Uh, those are all those are all forms of medievalism Um, and so my my use of modern medievalism was to sort of specify that I'm thinking about our current era. So how do we kind of use these ideas of the Middle Ages now? So why why do you think that it, like, why do we obsess with this particular time period in, in pop culture, like you mentioned, Disney or in Game of Thrones or like Lord of the Rings is a perfect example. We kind of take this time period and then like fictionalize it in a lot of weird ways. So whether it be adding these mythical creatures associated with this time period or maybe getting rid of some of the actual bad stuff like the terrible sewage bad hygiene what have you what what is it is it a psychological thing that we have nowadays but you also mentioned in the 19th century like a couple hundred years ago this this was also a particular interest of Uh of uh maybe pop culture or or the basic sort of culture of the day what what is it is it a psychological thing what can you piece that together at all so yeah no that's a it's a really good question um and the 19th century is actually really important in how this idea of medievalism develops it's i'm going to first sort of divide it into two two general trends that we see one is to a colleague of mine says it's when you use the middle ages as like the trash bin of history So like, you know, they talk about the, you know, terrorists as being like medieval in their techniques, you know, Pulp Fiction, I'm going to get medieval on your ass, right? (laughs) Like something very primitive, like as if only people in the Middle Ages were doing things like raping and killing and torturing. We don't do that now, uh, right? Wrong. But (laughs) um, there's a lot of sort of things about the Middle Ages, you know, it's gotten a bad rap through a lot of those things. So a lot of even some of the you know, for example, despite the fact that there were all these hygiene issues, there were also cities that actually had, you know, various kinds of water um, hygiene systems that made the water very drinkable. They had various kinds of bathing practices that we don't think of when we think of the Middle Ages, because we're so used to thinking of them as in dirty and in the past. 
On the other hand, you can romanticize the Middle Ages and make it perfect. And it's like knights and ladies and pretty dresses and girls with pointy hats and all those things. So the trash bin or like the princess, right? You have <laughs> these two versions. The reason we're so obsessed, like we either use it for one of those two, two purposes. We imagine a beautiful past or we kind of imagine a terrible past is that we have been taught to think of the Middle Ages as the origin of our meaning kind of generalized Western culture, that this is the birthplace. And again, I'm kind of, I'm using heavy air quotes everywhere here, <laughs> the birthplace of our culture. And in the 19th century, people talked about Chaucer that way. They said in the Middle Ages, he was like uh, the, the, you know, the um, author of our infancy. They talked about um, even his language was like, they sort of compared his language to like a juvenile form of English, like a, like a child would speak. And so if we think about the Middle Ages, it's like, we're, it's in our babyhood, like we're just little, this is when we started and now we've grown. Uh, it's, we kind of either want to see that we've evolved somehow, that we're looking at this like, okay, we're getting better. Look at us. Like we used to be like this, now we're way better. Or we want to see something kind of pure and wonderful in, in what our origin story is. So this idea of the Middle Ages as our origin, as where we start, you know, where our political system starts, the Magna Carta, you know, where the church starts, where like Western religion starts. It's, it's all of these end up kind of being important. They were formed, I wouldn't say that they, many of them started, they do start in the Middle Ages. Um, um, but of course, you can then ignore the influence of the classical period, the Romans and the Greeks and all that stuff too. <laughs> you can ignore the influence of the Arabic world on the development of our scientific method, the development of mathematics. Um, and you can just focus on, look, medieval Western Europe, that's us. This is the beginning. So you mentioned psychological reasons. I think that's deeply psychological. You know, we, this is what we want to imagine ourselves as having come from. Hmm. Sorry, that was kind of a long-winded <laughs> response. It's a really no. good question. Made sense so. though, yeah. And then you obviously, I think, Noel, you have a bit of a personal interest, maybe a bit of a passion towards beer and craft beer. You're located in a, a great <laughs> spot for it. We... <laughs> We in Toronto, we like to think we have a very good craft beer scene, but maybe not as good as what you have on the West Coast. It's debatable, but I, I suspect you wouldn't <laughs> think it's debatable. Um, so you connect in in your book, you connect medievalism with what we have today as you can call it whatever you want, the, the massive growth in craft beer over the last two or three, maybe four decades. So you kind of associate medievalism to modern day craft beer, Western craft beer culture. Why, why do you do that? So I think there is an element of medievalism in a fairly substantial subset of craft beer marketing. Um, meaning that we look to craft beer, the value of craft in part is kind of premised on not only it's sort of, um, individual ownership of the brewery uh, and the quality of the beer, but also its connection to a kind of pre-industrialized world. And when I say that, I mean, I, I realize that craft brewery, breweries aren't like back there with like big pots and barrels and whatever, like they're, <laughs> they're using <laughs> like proper brewing equipment, but they're not, they're certainly not using it to the kind of industrial scale that you see at, you know, Molson plants, right. Or, or, Budweiser, I guess Budweiser owns Molson now. Um, at those those big corporate beer plants, there's certainly more close attention to the production of the beer in the way that we imagined it was done in the past. And we think of the origin of beer as medieval because there's this deep association of beer with monks um, in our sense of beer's past. Again, because this is almost kind of built into our culture now. Really, we should think of beer as ancient from ancient Sumeria and ancient Egypt, because that's really where it's first made. But we don't think of it as like people putting bread in a in a you know a potted pottery jar and water and letting it ferment with grape skins and then drinking it out of a straw. We don't think of that. We think of the monks, right? 
So that connection of the medieval past as a kind of beer origin has informed so much of modern beer marketing, even if it's not really explicit. And I, I thought of this the other day, I visited um, Central City Brewing in here in Surrey. Uh, Central City was founded in 2003 and it's it's fairly large. I, I think it would still be considered craft, but it's, it's a pretty big brewery. It was one of the first kind of in Canada to be making IPAs, one of the most successful IPAs. So it's an important brewery. And the brewer there, I talked to Gary Lowen, he had a collection of old bottles that he'd sort of collected from the, the 90s and the 2000s and a whole bunch of them, these old labels, labels are getting more kind of dramatic nowadays, but especially in these early days of marketing, they were designed to look like, almost like manuscript pages. And I took some pictures of them, um, but they use what we think of as a kind of medieval font, the structure with like an mm. illuminated initial, the kind of what we call a book hand or kind of a Gothic script. And it makes us think of this medieval past. And like this beer is made with these old recipes. You know, it's made with this, these old techniques. It's more authentic. It's authentic, it's real beer. And that notion of authenticity is often, however it's created, however this sense of authenticity is created, it can be created through medievalism. It's created through other methods as well. That's often what people are looking for when they want a craft beer is they want authenticity from the brewery and from the beer. And so I think medievalism helps create authenticity or create a sense of authenticity. Do you think that authenticity is valid or do you think it's that's just marketing? <laughs> that's a that's a kind of a hard question. Yeah, um, <laughs> I agree. <laughs> yeah. It's, you have to come down to the brewery to that. For that. I mean, so, so, so many things are just marketing, though. Honestly, mm -hmm. and I can't. I'm. I, I certainly wouldn't. Don't blame mm. brewers who are marketing their product <laughs> in a way that's emotionally compelling. I think that's reasonable, um, and I think they all want to feel authentic. And I, I think for most breweries, that desire to present that sense of authenticity isn't coming from like a place of deception, like they're like rubbing their hands behind the scenes going, these idiot customers. I, th I think it's a, a legitimate desire to kind of put an emotion, put a embody what they feel the spirit of their brewery is. And I think medievalism can help you kind of embody that spirit, right? You want to feel, people want to feel they have a connection to the past and, and it might be a kind of imagined connection, <laughs> mm -hmm. but often that's exactly what our connections to the past are. In some ways they're imagined, right? And that's okay. Like I, uh, no shade on, on anyone that is sort of enjoys that. Like, I think it's part of being human. So whether that's authentic, I, it's, it's a powerful word. And, um, it's almost like more ideological than reality based. Mm -hmm. It's funny. You just go ahead. Go, go ahead. Andy. I was just going to throw it in. Like that's maybe comes into the big ma macro versus micro uh, debate as well, right? I mean, authenticity is probably thrown right into that mix because, you know, how do you view craft beer? Is it now craft because it's macro? Is it still using the same yes. authentic recipe, right? Probably some yeah. effect as well. Totally. Well, there was a recently uh, one of the big breweries won, I don't know, I can't remember if it was a BC beer competition or a Canadian one. They won, it was like Molson or Bud one one of the categories like the pale ale category or something like that with the blind tasting um i think it was blue moon there was kind of like oh like there's a it's not a real but it's like well like what's i mean if people like to the taste and i guess what if you don't want to put your money towards that company that's different but mm -hmm. it, it just i think it led to some interesting conversations <laughs> about what is yeah what is authentically good beer what makes a beer a craft beer and yeah I think it was like just it was just a beer competition, not necessarily a craft beer competition, which is why they still had an entry. Now that you're mentioning, it, yeah, I think, I think like you're right. Yeah, up. yeah. So yeah. anyone could, yeah, could enter. Yeah, no, this is this is an interesting question because it. I've been thinking about it a lot today. I put a bunch of stories on my Instagram about this actually because I'm writing about Vancouver brewing. Have you guys heard of Stanley Park Brewery? Uh, mm, I certainly know Stanley familiar. Park. <laughs> so there's a Stanley Park Brewery. Mm -hmm. Um, and it says in the bottles, established 1897. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, the actual Stanley Park Brewery 
which was actually established in 1896, um, closed or was sold rather in 1903. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have to get into the details of that. Anyway, it didn't, it, the brewery was done after about, even after this merger, after about 1908, there's no more. Something called Turning Point Brewery, which is a subsidiary company of a big corporation, started making Stanley Park Brewing beer in 2009. Now, Turning Point has never made their own beers. There's no like Turning Point beer anywhere. And in fact, if you go to Turning Point Brewery, it takes you to the Stanley Park Brewery website. There's no Stanley Park Brewery though, at all now. They have Stanley Park Brewery beer and it's labeled Stanley Park Brewing, whatever the Amber Ale, et cetera. But there's no, not actually a Stanley Park Brewery. It's Turning Point Brewery making the brand Stanley Park and then saying it was established in 1897. Wow. And it's kind of, and I, I'll give them credit. They're like the past like five years, their beer has actually gotten a lot better than it was. So they've like, up their game and there's mm. some really nice beer so like nothing wrong with the beer but the whole narrative and they've kind of backed a little off of it the past couple of years this narrative about like we were established over 100 years ago i'm like no you weren't and there's still <laughs> no Stanley park brewery it's an imagined history or at least their connection to it is imagined the hit the brewery itself existed it has no connection to this brand which is not a real brewery now so it was, it's something that I've been thinking about today quite a bit as I've been kind of going, going through the chapters of this book. I think it really does connecting to the idea of marketing and advertising your product. It really does you a big service if you have an interesting story to provide, because you have, you have a few, you have lots of different beer companies that really leverage their past. And you kind of, if you really go back in their past, you think you can really find some glitches in what they're talking about. I yeah. mean, like a big brewery in Ontario is Sleeman's Brewery in Guelph, Ontario. And they like to really boast about their history into the 1800s. And they were part of the, the, Prohibition. the, the Prohibition period, sending illegal beer across the lake to Al Capone's cronies. To, <laughs> that was Al Capone's favorite beer. And a lot, and then, but, but it's not really the whole story necessarily. I mean, like Sleeman closed down for many decades because it was an illegal enterprise. And then now it's a, it's owned by Sapporo, the big Japanese yeah. behemoth. So it's like, you don't really leverage that part of the story. <laughs> you tend to focus on yeah, particular yeah. aspects yeah. of it that are more favorable than oh, others. And John Sleeman's little recipe book where the cream ale, like, his recipe for the cream ale was discovered in the grandpa's recipe book. And yeah, yeah. Uh, Sleeman's cream ale had a big influence on the Vancouver beer industry because Shaftbury Brewing that Sleeman purchased later on made a cream ale that was, and it wasn't a cream ale and Sleeman's wasn't a cream ale either, um, but they were sort of influenced by it. It's more like a dark, it's like a mild, it's not really a proper cream ale, but yeah. Um, it became like a gateway beer for people in Vancouver who had never tried ale <laughs> and realized like, oh, this is actually really good. It's called a cream ale. Cause like, they're, they're like, we're not going to call it a bitter or whatever. Like that's not, mm. that's not going to fly. It's, so it's called anymore. a cream ale. And like, the guy who named it, he didn't know anything about beer really. And he's like, oh, it sounds good. <laughs> Let's call Sleeman's has something called like that. Let's call it that. Mm. Um, yeah. So Sleeman's has its own kind of uh, influence on, uh, on our scene here. But yeah, they 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 absolutely leverage that story, um, and and their connection with this past and like handwritten recipes. And again, it's pre-industrial, right? Sort of before machines took over, <laughs> before the machines took over. Every beer story is actually an apocalyptic, dystopian tale. <laughs> well, I think. Do you find it? I guess Noel, can you find any parallels in? maybe a small industry comparison to craft beer in terms of medievalism in the 21st century? Like, are there any other parallels? Like there is sort of a general movement to artisanship and mm -hmm. like Etsy and, and going to, to particular artisans to, to make more local, local 
products of substance as opposed to mass consumerism that we're all used to from the 20th century in, in the industrialized age. Do you do you see any parallels in in any other industries besides craft beer? I've I've thought about that a lot because a, a major kind of driver of medievalism in the 19th century was William Morris's promotion of the arts and crafts industry and making things by hand um, and encouraging people not to kind of fall for you know these machines that will do your weaving for you. And sorry, I'm kind of, I'm not really summarizing William Morris very well here, um, but basically an endorsement of handmade over industrialized. But nowadays it feels like to me that that's certainly less connected even than, than it was in the 19th century. It's less connected to our sense of, or our kind of imagined version of the middle ages like we don't naturally connect it to the middle ages because i also thought of the like the hundred mile diet or various other kinds of food movements that have you either growing your own food or buying local and those kinds of things where you're not relying on kind of global imports and and kind of you know air traffic and that kind of stuff but we don't we don't really imagine you know medieval people like plowing the fields when we're doing that like it's not something that's used to market it like you wouldn't put a medieval plowman on the side of the the truck or whatever <laughs> it, it feels <laughs> <laughs> it in terms of industries like for me it feels like beer has been kind of unique in its and how often it's been tied to this pre-industrial kind of imagined past. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's a good question. And I, I, for me, beer still feels really unique in this respect. But maybe maybe that's also because of, um, maybe it's because of of the way, I, I think we owe a lot to how Frank Appleton, if you've read, I don't know if you've read Frank Appleton's article in the Harold Smith from 1978. So Frank Appleton started, helped start, John Mitchell start the first craft brewery in Canada. And he wrote, I should send you the article because it's very memorable. Yes, please. But he, he basically writes about how the big beer corporations are producing the same bland, white bread, boring beer. You can't even tell the difference. The brewmaster used to be an artist. He's now an accountant who just has to tick boxes. Um, and the big beer companies take away everything that makes beer, beer. Um, and so he doesn't, Kind of specifically invoke the medieval past but it is part of a broader call that he makes to go back to the land um, and to go back to this kind of sort of to sort of make beer yourself to avoid the industry of beer and his article had a huge effect on brewers like you'll see a lot of breweries and brewers who refer to that article especially in the 80s um, so the founders of granville island brewing and of course, Bay Brewing, they were really influenced by that um, and Shaftbury as well. So it's um, uh, Frank Appleton, yeah, that call to the land, the association with the land, I think is super important uh, and tends to kind of overlap a lot with medievalism, even though he's not like explicitly saying it. But yeah, it's uh, I'm going to think about that more about other industries. But I, uh, for me, like I, I just don't see it in the same way in other industries. It feels like beer is feels really unique. Do you see it as sort of a a counterculture pushback to to everything else? Is that definitely part of it? In yeah, terms I think it's not, definitely part of it. Yeah, not only the uh, re rebellious efforts to ditch macro brewing, but also just everything in in twenty twenty two. Just everything moving so quickly. Technology is just. I mean, there's no craft cell phone company <laughs> by any means. So. <laughs> Is it, is that sort of yeah. part of it? I, I am, I am kind of struggling other than like, there is a bit of a more, more middle upper class culture of yeah. more farm to table food culture, but it's kind of less accessible. It's a bit more for the, the more financially privileged. So it, it is, I, I guess I would like to see more of, more of this pattern of, of what craft beer culture is, but I don't know. I don't need, I don't even know necessarily if it, I, are you, do you think is medievalism, is it, is it a good thing? Is it sort of a fetishization of a, a past that needn't be looked on, looked at in such a. I think it's definitely, a, a fet, uh, it's definitely a fetishization of it. <laughs> yeah. 
but um, it doesn't mean it's a, it doesn't mean that's bad. I, I think, I think we have to be just sort of conscious of how we're using the past. Like I love medievalism. I think it can be really fun. I just think kind of un, sort of uncritically sort of taking medie medievalism as fact is where you're like, uh, like then you're falling into sort of misunderstanding history and kind of mixing up myth, myth and reality. But I think understanding that we can play with the past and sort of use our kind of recreations of it to enjoy and mock and kind of honor elements of the past. I, I love that about medievalism. Like it can be very fun. And actually the big, the big beer companies, it's like they started to use medievalism in their marketing, I think because the craft beer industry was doing such a good job of like showing how their craft is connected to this, this past, this kind of origin story. And so if you've watched any of the Bud Knight commercials, <laughs> There's a whole series of commercials that Budweiser did called the Bud Knight. And there's one where the Bud Knight comes, then the king comes in and he's like, Bud Lights for everyone. And then some guy in the corner, he goes, oh, I'll have a mead, please. And this is clearly supposed to be mocking crap beer consumers. I'll have a mead. He's like, oh, and one mead. And then he goes, oh, is the mead autumnal and full bodied? And he's like, eh. and then Bud Knight comes and takes him out and puts him in the stocks. And I've then the song. king, the king goes, <laughs> just Bud, cancel the mead, just Bud Night, Bud Lights for everyone, and everyone's like, yay! And it said Bud Light, it's made for the many, not for the few. And it's like Budweiser is taking our sense of the medieval past as and, and using it to kind of turn that crap beer marketing on its head, and saying it's crap beer that's elite. It's not macro beer that's made, you know, that's elite. We're made for the many not for the few we're 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 imagining this kind of democratic version of the middle ages in which the king is like buying beers for everyone and um and everyone gets the same one at the same time uh, and then the crap beer person is the elite one and beer is not the crap beer is not an every an every man drink it's like just for you know the wealthy or the picky uh so Medievalism can absolutely be used uh, to whatever kind of direction, in whatever direction you want, right? To kind of make different points. It doesn't have to be just about mm -hmm. being revolutionary or being counterculture. It can in, it can be made to endorse a mainstream product like Bud Light. <laughs> can glorify something or at the same time criticize it. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it's very flexible because we kind mm -hmm. of put our it, it's it's like a mirror it becomes a sort of weird funhouse mirror where we get to reflect what values we want reflected often having nothing to do with the actual middle ages <laughs> which beer was very much in every and every man and every child drink mm -hmm. it was mm -hmm. even when monks were fasting they would still be having beer you know they'd have a get there was records show monks being assigned a gallon of beer a day and these are like very restrict like disciplined men <laughs> So, um, I mean, low alcohol beer, but even so it's, uh, that's the kind of reality of, of beer. But again, we can kind of create a connection to the past that might reflect something different or imagine a connection. I, I need to watch the, that commercial. I haven't seen that commercial. Is, it's very funny. I mean, yeah. I have to, I have to give them credit. Like it ended, it's very entertaining. It, does it was very funny. clever. And they also, well, I think they also use the same sort of, uh, medievalism to like slam Coors as well. And yes, the same, I think, yeah. Same string of commercials. Yeah. They're going after everybody. Yeah. Mm. Controversial. Yeah. Can really shift the narrative in which any, whichever direction you, you absolutely. choose. Absolutely. That's the mm. kind of beauty of this, this sort of tool, right? Like, how are you, which fun house mirror are you using to reflect yeah. the past? <laughs> mm -hmm. Exactly. Well, Noel, we're coming up on our hour mark, so we want to be respectful of your time, of course, but I thought maybe we could take the last five minutes to talk a little bit about the book you're currently writing, because I myself, Garrett, is as well, but I'm quite particularly keen on Canadian urban history and its connection, connection with beer. So you're focusing on Vancouver, correct? Mm -hmm. So it's sort of, it's beer past in the 1800s up to the early 1900s and then also in from the 80s 1980s up until modern day 
So what is significant of these time periods and where do you draw connections between them? Is that sort of the purpose or you're just sort of analyzing two particular so this, areas? This is a book that's really designed for a public audience. So it won't be an academic book uh, like my other books are. And I'll still have lots of footnotes, don't worry. But <laughs> I'm trying to make it a little more like a, a fun a fun read, telling stories that haven't been told. Uh, so it's basically the two craft beer or independent beer, independent brewing booms in Vancouver. Uh, Vancouver was incorporated in 1886, so we don't have a city of Vancouver <laughs> before then. Uh, but you get a kind of um, rapid growth of breweries sort of starting, and many of them sort of closing fairly quickly, uh, starting at about 1887. Uh, so basically right after the Great Fire, Vancouver incorporated, then two months later, a fire destroyed the entire city, which is like, like not a great start to the city, mm. uh, but they rebuilt really fast and breweries started cropping up right away. And so I could not find much information about these early brewers, like up until prohibition in the histories that we have mm. currently, um, even the ones that kind of call themselves a history of this um, were remarkably under research um, and under cited. So I wanted to find I've looked through a lot of contemporary sources. I've talked to a lot of different people and I found some really interesting stories and, and uh, things about these early brewers and breweries that haven't really been told, relationships that haven't been kind of uncovered or, or acknowledged. So I think hopefully that'll be interesting to people who kind of like old beer stories. Uh, but after the brewing industry kind of dies right before prohibition, and then Carling, Labatt, and Molson basically take over um, through a bunch of mergers and acquisitions. Uh, and I start up again, part two is what happens when craft beer resurrects itself, right? And beginning with Frank Appleton, Horseshoe Bay Brewing and Granville Island Brewing, and then kind of things start to speed up in Vancouver, uh, especially after 2012, where basically provincial changes lead to this explosion of new breweries. So. I'm not gonna be able to talk about every single brewery in Vancouver, but I hope to give a sense of how and why the industry has developed in the way it did since about 1980 and uh, what's happened more recently, you know, with the Me Too movement, with the Black Lives Matter movement, with the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, how has this affected Vancouver beer? What makes, you know, the Vancouver beer scene unique? What has contributed to it? Um, you know, what is drinking beer in Vancouver like? drinking crap beer in Vancouver like. So I'm hoping it'll be interesting, um, a kind of past and present uh, view of Vancouver beer. And I've been working on it for almost two years. And yeah, I'm, I'm about two thirds of the way through actually writing it after after all my interviews and library trips. So Sounds well, well, interesting. yeah, we, we would love to have you maybe on again once the book's finished. We'd love to yeah, no, I'll, I'll let you know when, uh, knock on wood, I get, I get a contract with the publisher. So, and I, I can't wait for it to be done too. I can't wait to read it once it's done. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Awesome. Well, Noel Phillips, um, thank you very much for your time. We really appreciate, um, your particular expertise, not something that we always focus on with beer, but, uh, modern medievalism, medievalism, it's a very interesting concept. And I think it's definitely associated with the beer culture we have today. So craft beer culture and modern medievalism. This is a very wonderful text that I definitely encourage anyone to, to seek out. Um, Noel Phillips, thank you very much for your time and we look forward to chatting again soon. Great, thank you. Be sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all our interviews and beer related content. Remember, craft beer is here.